Chapter 6 of Quest of the Golden Ape by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Quest of the Golden Ape. Chapter 6 On the Plains of Ofrid. Jilomek the Nadian guided his air car across the grassy plains of Ofrid, but a scant few feet above the tops of waving grasses. It was a fine day, and the Nadian was taking full advantage of it. One of a race of proud and noble fighting men, Jlomek was an exception to the rule in that he was a dreamer rather than a fighter, a thinker rather than a doer, a poet rather than a military strategist. Thus his mind dwelt upon the historic incident of the previous days, when, standing beside his brother Bontark, he had watched the gray tower of Portox the Ophridian explode into a fine cloud of dust and it was characteristic of the gentle Jlomek that his mind was more occupied with the romantic aspect of the incident than the violent. He thought of the poem, the bit of doggerel carved in the foundation stone of the tower. For a century all Tarthans had puzzled over the verse put there by Portox so long ago. An ape, a boar, a stallion, a land beyond the stars, a virgin's feast, a raging beast, a prison without bars. Had it any meaning, Jlomek wondered? A thousand different interpretations had been put upon the verse over the years, but no one knew for sure. That it had something to do with the slaughter of the Ophridians, Jlomek was sure. But what? As he ruminated thus, Jlomek's attention was caught by moving figures some ten jecks to the south. He knew this to be the location of one of the great wells that dotted the plains of Ofrid. In the times before the great massacre, these wells had been located in the hearts of the fine Ofridian cities, of which the Abarians stood in great envy. These wells gushed endlessly of cool crystal water which kept the fabulous hanging gardens of Ofrid multicolored and beautiful. But all that was in the past. The Ophridians had been slain to a man, and their cities leveled until not a stone stood upon a stone. Now lonely grasses grew where once glittered the results of Portox's great scientific genius. Now there were only round steel doors in the ground to mark the locations of the great Ophridian wells. These thoughts occupied Jlomek's mind as he turned his car and coursed it in the direction of the well. The figures came clearly into view causing Jlomek to frown in puzzlement. What manner of people were these? There were a half-dozen of them, two men, three females, and one babe in arms. Jlomek got the impression that, though they were erect and finely formed, that they were of short stature. But now he realized he had got this impression only by their comparison to the seventh figure by the well. He knew at a glance that this seventh was an Abarian warrior, exceptionally tall and wearing the look of grim cruelty so characteristic of his race. Jlomek paid the Abarian scant heed, however, so engrossed was he in studying the strange half-dozen. Their skins were richly browned, and they wore almost no clothing. Who could they be? Jlomek wondered, and from whence had they come? Mightily intrigued, he moved forward until he came within earshot of the party. Then, for reasons of the words he heard spoken, he halted his air-car and frowned. The Abarian he recognized as the famed Retok himself. A fierce stad pawed the ground nearby, indicating how the tall, sneering commander of the Abarians had arrived at this spot. Retok was known to roam the plains of Ofrid at times, still savoring the destruction he and his sire, Harnad, had accomplished, pleasuring himself with memories of bodies piled high, of bloody swords and helpless cries of the dying. Or was it for some other reason that Retok roamed the plains? Was it a nameless fear that drove him there? Did the accusing face of Portox the Ophridian genius still hang balefully in his memory? Had Portox acquainted the Abarian devil with knowledge that he alone carried in his guilty heart? And did that knowledge generate a fear that Retok the Abarian could not rid himself of? At any rate, 
he now stood between the brown people and the Ophridian well, enjoying a useless cruelty, as was his custom. The leader of the group extended his hands in supplication and said, "'We only ask water, sire, a small thing, but long have we waited to quench our thirst.' Retok said, "'What manner of people are you?' "'Harmless ones. See? We are unarmed and peaceful.' "'That does not answer my question. Tell me who you are and from whence you came. Then we will see whether my fancy dictates that you shall have water from this well.' Indignation and rage dimmed Jlomek's better judgment. He had glided in beyond the range of Retok's vision, and now he leapt from his car and drew his wand-like whip-sword. "'Is there no drop of common decency or compassion left in you, Retok, that you do this thing to helpless people?' The Iberian whirled with alarm, not knowing what force might be arrayed against him. But when he saw the lone Jlomek, his composure returned and his self-assurance again took charge. Had the newcomer been Bontark, the dreamy Jlomek's skillful brother, Retok the Iberian would have conducted himself differently. But as it was, he sneered at the gentle Nadian and asked, "'What business of this is yours, Jlomek?' "'Injustice is everyone's business. These people, whoever they are, ask only to drink.' Jlomek's eyes blazed. "'And drink they shall, Iberian!' Retok's handsome eyes glowed, no doubt as to the outcome of this contest. He drew his own sword and whipped its supple length through the air. "'Since you choose to champion this scum, let's get on with it.' Had Jlomek's indignation not been of a quality to blind him to consequences, he would have perhaps hesitated. But hot with this injustice, he whipped his own sword and leapt at Retok. The latter, with a grim smile of confidence, parried the thrust with ease and manipulated his own whipsword with a skill which few fighting men on the planet Tarth could have equaled. The weapons were strange ones by earth standards and would have probably been considered impractical. They were a good six feet in length, with the supple resiliency of a fly casting rod. The trick of using them effectively lay in controlling the sway and whip of the long thin blades by skillful use of the wrist. An expert Tarthan swordsman could parry a thrust with the lightning whip of his blade, arc the singing steel in the opposite direction, and perhaps bring his opponent down with a thrust that would enter between his shoulder blades, the sword still arced to describe a half-circle. In essence, this favorite weapon of the Tarthans was a combination of whip and sword, and combat was a matter of thrusting at angles far wider than could be achieved with a stiff blade. A good Tarthan swordsman would have been an excellent billiard player on earth, for his knowledge of workable angles was of necessity supreme. Retok the Iberian was a master at this sword play. Enjoying himself hugely, because there was little risk, he toyed with the less skillful Nadian. He did not intend to kill Jlomek, fearing the wrath of Bontark. He meant only to teach the stupid Nadian a lesson he would not forget. But as his blade sang and stung, its needle-point darting in like the fangs of a snake's head, and as Jlomek's clumsy blade sought desperately to parry, Retok's bloodlust rose to the fore. The joy of dealing death to the helpless was upon him, and with a swift thrust, he allowed his blade to enter Jlomek's unprotected back just above the kidney, to streak upward through his body and pierce his heart. Frightened at what he had done, he jerked the blade free. Its entwined force whirled Jomek in a complete circle from which he fell limply, dead before he hit the ground. Retok stood scowling at the fallen Nadian, his dripping blade rising and falling gently in the breeze as he held it extended. The Abarian's eyes darted to the group of brown-skinned folk, his anger centering upon them as he nimbly switched the blame for this foul murder from his own shoulders to theirs. If they had not been at the well, he was ready to extend his slaughter in their direction to wipe out the lot of them when he paused, his scowl deepening. There was fear and awe upon their faces, but they were not regarding either Retok or his fallen adversary. 
Their eyes were turned in another direction, and Retok sent his own glance after theirs. His eyes held upon what he saw. A naked man. But such a man as he had never before seen on all the planet Tarth. End of chapter 6